yeah, it's very, it's very hard to, to eliminate corruption in, a, in places where corruption has been a, a main source of revenue for one of the political actors. In fact, today, I don't have a, a very positive story of today. Uh, in Parliament, we wanted to take down the leadership of the Anti-Corruption Commission, who, who, by the way, even though we are one of the highest, we have the highest number of Magnitsky cases in Europe, we have not a single guy that's on Magnitsky that's been investigated by the Anti-Corruption Commission of Bulgaria. So in Parliament today, uh, my party and we, we voted to, to get this leadership out and Borisov uh, and Pevsky's party and uh, some guys that were they're talking Euro-Atlantic but they're really on the other side uh, and the socialists voted against this so this this fight is uh, is complicated one thing that you mentioned the European resilience and recovery plan was one way to put a mark and an amount of money value to, to corruption. We said these are the reforms and they would cost Bulgarians 12 billion if they're not made. Let's see which politician would come and say, I don't want the 12 billion. And we thought we had cornered them, to be honest. Uh, turned out not to be the case. They're like 12 billion, not 12 billion. We're not going to, to, to be proponents on the anti-corruption policies. The point of, of, of this thing is that we're trying to innovative ways to, to curb corruption. Uh, EU money tying to, to reform policies is a big deal. Uh, we also are trying to put as much pressure by putting transparency. One thing about, of course, corruption is always having a problem. In order to have corruption, you have to have little secrets. And little secrets happen within the same number of people in a dark room. That's how it works. Uh, so if you put the lights on and we say, OK, let's see who is in the room, it starts to become uncomfortable. Uh, and to some degree, unfortunately, though, uh, the risk of going to jail for corruption charges oversees anything. And the other thing that, that's an issue is what we call the permanent infrastructure in these countries. The prosecutor's office, the security service apparatus, the regulators like the SEC type of regulators, uh, they are all bound to the same corruption principles. So it's actually... Uh, it's a, it's a complicated game. In the beginning, we thought we we're going to win it in three moves, like in chess. Turns out that the best thing we can do is the small cracks. And the other thing that we have to do is redirect cash flows to places where the guys cannot reach. For example, we elevated one million people above the poverty line by giving them extra pensions. And the pensions are still the lowest in Bulgaria, in, out of all of the EU. But no matter who comes, they cannot decrease pensions that are already given. And this money being transferred there, all of a sudden the surpluses that were given to friends and family before were not able to be given regardless of who is in power. So what we're seeing today uh, in these multiple tasks is that when you take out some of the cash flows that are available for corruption, the whole system is, is designed to absorb a lot of cash flows. I mean, everybody has to get paid. So when you take out the cash, uh, the result is that interfighting starts. So for the first time in 30 years, one of the most corrupt parties, the MRF, that was a symbol of corruption, broke in two because they start fighting on the limited level of, of funds that were available only by our two governments. Our, my partner, the finance minister, was able to, to eliminate. He said the point is it's a possible game. And here where the U.S. has done actually a good job uh, was the Magnitsky sanctions. It's a tool that Magnitsky's, uh, Magnitsky sanctions works. The one thing, though, that would be done more effectively, it should not cover just the top guy. It should cover it's the whole cluster around uh, a person that, that is a key to corruption. For example, today, Pevsky, uh, even though he's on, on Magnitsky's list, is living the life. One of his partners is holding his real estate. The other one is holding his cash. Uh, so he's like, I'm on Magnitsky and I don't care. So I think that's, even, even though it was very efficient in the beginning, uh, we have to think how to do a cluster approach so that it attacks the network. It doesn't affect a single individual. As you mentioned, my, yeah, it's yeah. The, the, the Italian model <laughs> should be applied. <laughs>
lines, which is what a second Trump administration would mean for Bulgaria um, and the Western Balkans more broadly in terms of defense policy and energy security. You know, it, it's interesting. I, I do I do applaud uh, the current administration for what they did in the moment when when Russian gas when you you made the bold decision they they worked every avenue to get gas there as quickly as they could. I know they were working hard on it. Um, having said that, uh, when it when it comes to the policy in the region or, or frankly energy policy, I, I just think I just think a, a Republican model is a better fit for delivering better outcomes for the entire region. Um, it's a model that understands the the absolute imperative for economic independence. We were just we were railing on the Germans about their reliance on Russian gas, and while uh, while we had a few knockdown dragouts with uh, then the chancellor, the exchequer Schultz, now Chancellor Schultz, over this very issue, um, we, we 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 didn't know it would end this way, but we knew it would end badly, and and so. To, to help Bulgaria get to the right place, it, it has to be systemic. And that's harder for us because the, the Russians have a single decision maker who sits in Moscow and we have the complexity of Bulgarian leadership, EU leadership, each nation having its own, its, its own say and its own different dynamic. Um, in fact, if you look at the neighbors for Bulgaria, right? Whether it's the Roma near neighbors, right? Romanians, Turks, uh, uh, North Macedonia. Look at each of that. Each of them has a different, slightly different set of interests, and certainly a different decision-making model. The the one nation that can seek to try and drive a strategic theory of the case for the entire region, not just for for Bulgaria, is frankly us, with a unitary decision-making capability when exercised from the executive branch in a way that can actually drive these anti-corruption campaigns and give space to the pro-freedom parties, the parties that actually want to be part of Europe, want to be part of the West and disconnect themselves from Russia. And uh, that that's the task for us as Americans and American leaders to get right every day. And then we will, we will ultimately get an election in Bulgaria that delivers that outcome in a way that is both a decent and stable. Yes, please. Uh, Tom Gamper and Trellix were a cybersecurity company merger with Matthew Fire. I've been doing a, a lot of work with NATO, we only do work with the U.S. So uh, the whole cybersecurity disinformation set of issues is near and dear to us. You know, I'm um, interested in, in both our, our leaders here on the view of the Russian uh, use of cyber and disinformation uh, tactics and methods to uh, destabilize, uh, destabilize the West. Well, I'll, I'll go, I'm happy to go first. I'm, I'm not sure exactly how to answer that. It is broad. It is deep. Um, it's run by the same guys who were in your embassy, uh, uh, largely. That sounds like a lot of them. Uh, much like we had a bunch of Chinese in our Houston embassy. This is, uh, the bad guys always show up first with diplomatic uh, ID cards. Uh, look, they're, they're, they're very capable of not only not only taking over media outlets, that is, acquiring, buying, having proxies hold those assets so they have editorial control over the institutions, the, 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 the means of communication and the message inside of that communication. Um, but they're also very good at working bottoms up, that is with massive efforts from the populace to get replication of their messages. And this is where there's lots of cyber work to be done. Some of this is overt, visible, you can see. Other of it feels more clandestine, not not quite as good as a battery in a beeper, but clandestine <laughs> none, none, nonetheless. Uh, where the the effort is to obfuscate the hand clearly, right, so that it doesn't look like it is Russian disinformation, but looks like these are ordinary people speaking in the voice of Bulgarians in this case, or folks in the Balkans more broadly. Um, one of the things that cyber organizations can do, like yours is you can shine the light in the way the prime minister spoke of. You can begin to identify these Russian networks and then certainly make sure that the population is aware of it. And hopefully you will find governments that are prepared to assist in taking those networks down inside of their own countries. That it is hard stuff. Um, there, there is no doubt it is whack-a-mole. So as you take down a particular network, you take down a particular information stream, the Russians will generate more. Uh, and it is especially difficult to do if you are country specific focused because these media have no right there's there's no boundary to this this has to be a broader deeper effort to push back against this disinformation not only in the balkans but in 
Denver, Colorado. Right? This is this is everywhere and throughout. I hope that answers your question. No, at least, at least the part. You. Yes, sir. I'll just follow up and add to, to your comments. Fully agree. Uh, what we see in Bulgaria specifically, uh, they have few elements. Uh, the mushroom websites. So you put the message and it all of a sudden it appears in 500 sites. And most of those sites are supposedly gossip sites. And then they, they co combine it with the throw factories. So it all appears under the comments in the social media outlets. And the other thing that they're doing very well, they're branding individual people. So they actually hit on the same point. For example, the three uh, leaders in my parties, myself, the finance minister, and the second prime minister that we had, they actually, even though they look like random comments, they target the same point to make a brand. For example, I'm the one that cannot speak somehow. It, and Harvard is the worst university, by the way. Uh, yeah, the, the, the second one, Asen, who is truly a genius guy, uh, he's supposedly the smart one, but the T. And the third one, just because he's a little bit lighter weight, uh, the prime minister, he's in the top 1% of the Stanford list of, of graduate of, uh, scientists, uh, is supposedly the weak guy that cannot compare to the strong man of the Balkans. Uh, and when you do 500 mushroom sites, all these comments, every day, a thousand articles per month, you start create public awareness and you start building a brand that actually penetrates. So, and the final point is, of course, China is the, is, the big, is the big elephant in the room. We all understand it. And uh, we have to face it. We cannot dance around and talk about the Ukrainian issue as though uh, China is not the big answer to the puzzle. So that would be my, my uh, two cents. But of course, I don't have the experience that my have. So. <laughs> You're a prime minister, I'm just, a little, <laughs> just, just a little secretary. Exactly. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. Um, I think we have to come to a close now, but um, if everyone would join me in giving our speakers a round of applause for this incredible <laughs>